Welcome to GOB with Christy and Kathy, where we talk about writing, reading, and life in between. I'm Christy in South Florida. And I'm Kathy in South Dakota. We're two newbie writers who share our love of food, wine, and crime fiction. We have interviews with best-selling and award-winning authors on our Corks and Conversation episodes. And don't forget our Words in Progress episodes where we have fun writing lessons with writing experts. Join us for today's episode. Welcome to Corks and Conversation with Lars Emmerich. Lars is the USA Today best-selling author of the Sam, Jameson, and Peter Kittredge conspiracy thriller series, which have been read by over 1 million thriller fans. 1 million. It's a nice, nice number. Um, but today we're talking about a standalone, or maybe the introduction to a new series. We'll have to see what he says. It is the thriller called Monarch. Yes. It features this larger-than-life character named Quinn, <laughs> which I can't wait to talk to him about. Lars, it's great to have you here with us today. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. So um, I just want to jump right in and ask you, what should our readers know about this guy, Quinn, and why will we want to follow him along in this thrilling, and I mean action-packed <laughs> thriller of a ride? <laughs> yes. That's a great question. Quinn is one of my favorite characters. Um, he showed up in my very first novel, and then in several, I just couldn't keep him out of the novels afterwards. <laughs> and I thought, man, I love his perspective. I, I want to live in that voice for a while. So I, I gave him a novel <laughs> and um, that's one of the best received ones. What his deal is, is Quinn does bad things for good reasons. <laughs> and sometimes he does bad things for bad reasons. Yeah, he's, he spent some time in the clandestine services and a lot of that business is not dinner table conversation necessarily with your mom. And so he's <laughs> in that world and there's a, a certain sort of point of no return when you enter that world and you can't exit after that point of return. So he's, he's coming to terms with the more unsavory sides of his own nature and the more unsavory sides of the business that he's in. And yet there's something heroic down there in the mix with everything else about old Quinn as jaded and as world weary as he might be, he's got that, he's got a spark of something good and something great. So, and he's got an interesting perspective on life. So he's a fun character to kind of inhabit in a story like this. So he was just kind of begging for his own novel for it a while. It felt like that to me, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I just couldn't keep him out. Does he work for the government now or is he sort of on his own? Or can we say, we don't want to give a whole lot away, but. Well, he's, um, <laughs> he's a contractor type. And the thing about being a contractor is you're, you're subject to fewer, we'll call them, I mean, you're subject to the same legal restrictions, but you're subject to far <laughs> less administrative and operational oversight. That's what I'm so, uh, I would say the second chapter, right? Not the, not yeah. the first chapter, but the second chapter where we're introduced to Quinn and his circumstances. For some reason, it reminded me of um, one of the opening scenes in True Lies. Remember the Schwarzenegger mm, yeah, movie, True Lies? Because yeah. there's kind of a sexy, remember yeah, they're like, they're dancing, yep. but he's also, you know, taking everybody out. And I liked his admiration of his lovely Catherine. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but also handling things. Mm. And I just, I, I thought it was kind of a sexy, fun opening scene. Not as funny as True Lies by any means, but... It's a great combination of like sexy, but also very serious and kick-ass. And well, thank you. It pulls you in. I appreciate that. Yeah, sure. That was yeah. a fun chapter. I remember, I remember the day I wrote that chapter and feeling like, oh, this might go someplace. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. See what happens. <laughs> so when you write, you just kind of just go that way. You don't really have it a plan. When I begin, mm -hmm. it's with a feeling or a vibe or a character or a scenario or just something that feels interesting. Every novel is like a tale of three novels for me, anyway. The first third is this kind of joyful discovery, and I'm just throwing things into the pot and the stew, and do they work, do they not work? <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's fun, it's light, it goes usually pretty quickly. After the first third, though, I start getting to that point where, hmm, all this is going to have to fit together somehow. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when I get to work, and... Um, 
I typically, I'll plot story beats, typically five to 10-ish sections in advance of, of writing them. But that starts in earnest about a third of the way through once I've sort of set up the conflict and the characters. And then the final third, that's just like math homework, you know, making all of the plot lines fit together. And, and that's mm. real work. That's like effort. And, yeah. and <laughs> that's when I have to live into my discipline self a little bit more and have a little, oh, you know, man. make it happen. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it deals with a lot of, I don't know, unsavory characters, runs into a lot of um, people, like you said, bad things, bad people, good you know circumstances that warrant it. And you had mentioned, I don't know if it was on your website or your blog, that writers can help mend maybe or bring together public discourse. You know, with so much going on in the world and your character, Quinn, dealing with so many things, I would love for you to expound on that. I'm curious about your thoughts about that. Yeah, I think it's um, it's been the case over the years that particularly, you know, in difficult political circumstances, that novelists can say things allegorically that aren't allowed to be said by other people in other kind of scenarios. And also, there's this thing that if, if you would like to change somebody's mind, you shouldn't tell them a fact, you should tell them a story. Mm-hmm. And so when you write a story or you tell a story, you give people the opportunity to walk around inside of somebody else's head for a little while. Mm. And you have the chance to demonstrate that while they may have arrived at some point of view that feels the polar opposite to your own, it wasn't because they were fundamentally flawed. It wasn't because there's some fundamental evil at the center of them that places them on the other side of this issue from from where we might sit. You can follow the trajectory and you can imagine yourself into those circumstances and you can follow this trail of somewhat reasonable decisions that lead you sometimes to these remarkable positions that you couldn't have predicted in advance and nobody could have. So I think it gives us the opportunity to to show that um, most of the people that we encounter on earth, even the ones, goodness forbid, who vote in a different way than you happen to (laughs) vote, aren't dumber, uh, less educated. They don't have ill intent. By and large, if they were to rank their top 10 values in life, I bet nine of their top 10 would also appear on our own lists. And Mm. maybe it's just a matter of one position or two for the values that we're, we're most concerned with. And it's sort of just down to what have you been told by the important people in your life? And that shapes your life much more than you think. And so that, that gives us a chance to, to stop othering other people and sort of have this sense of common experience and maybe even compassion and some understanding that, you know, if, if you had been born with that set of DNA and into that family in that country at that time, mm-hmm. you might very well have been on the complete opposite side of some important issue um, today. Mm-hmm. So that, that I think is, um, it's an important vantage point And I, I think it's pretty important for where we sit right now. Okay. So I think we should segue into what we call the question in the bottle. Um, this is a question that you might get to at the end of a bottle if you are enjoying one. <laughs> and I hope you are. This is an interesting one. If you were put in charge of minorly inconveniencing all the jerks in the world, what would you do? <laughs> what would I, if I, to minorly inconvenience a jerk, what do I do? I think I do this inadvertently and just by, you know, how we have those moments where we're lost in thought. And, oh, that's my exit. I have to get over real quick. I'm sure I've minorly, judging by the number of fingers I've seen in my lifetime, you know, the middle ones, <laughs> I've probably minorly inconvenienced the jerk just by walking around on so the So you're good at it. <laughs> just by your existence. Yeah, I think so. I think <laughs> many of us are. I don't know. I'd, yeah. make, him, do I'd make him always be second in line, like never be able to get to the front of the mm. line. <laughs> you're always next. Never first, but always yeah. next. Like that Seinfeld episode. <laughs> That's really funny. What about you, Kathy? Do you have any ideas? I might make my dog just bark at them when they're busy. Like that would be. Oh, that's a good one. She's kind of getting older and she's she's gone deaf in the last few months. We don't have any rationalization for her. But she can bark a lot. Usually during this podcast, she barks like two hours every afternoon. 
And it, it, it makes me a yeah, little bit so crazy. That, so that's I think what that's it, what they should do. always have a dog barking mm-hmm. in the background when a they're trying to get dog. something done. <laughs> <laughs> that's mm-hmm. a minor inconvenience. And they probably could work through it like we do. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Lars, I've been so excited to talk to you about the story that you include in the back of this mm-hmm. book. And it's on your blog about why you fired Amazon. Oh, yeah. Because nobody fires Amazon. So tell us the story. Um, well, I was you know, doing what every independent author does uh, at the beginning of my career. I, I read the publishing contracts or, you know, what was available. And I thought, this is a terrible deal. I don't know if I were held hostage and it got gunpoint, maybe I'd sign it. But I think I have options. So when I uploaded my books to all the retailers and I have a marketing background, so I knew how to push ads and uh, generate some sales and have the books climb up the ranks a little bit. And uh, one day I was minding my own business and I got a note from Amazon saying, we've noticed some very suspicious activity related to your account and we're not going to pay you a good portion of this month's royalties and you should just be very careful what you do with your account. And uh, we have, you know, we have strip all this kind of scolding email and I didn't change anything for weeks. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I have no idea what they're talking about. Of course, when they say we're not going to pay you, that yeah, <laughs> yeah, that gets a little. Suddenly, they had my undivided attention, and uh, it took me a few minutes to let my blood pressure settle <laughs> and write sentences without <laughs> f bombs in them. And I very politely, I thought, asked, wrote back, and said, "Sorry to have done whatever it is that I've done. Could, by the way, could you tell me what it is that I've done? I would be happy yeah. to fix it right now if you'd let me know. Send." I went and refreshed my coffee and I came back and I had the response already from Amazon huh. in like, I don't know, 40 nanoseconds or something. And uh, obviously it was an auto responder. And it said, yeah. we have reviewed your case and we've decided to uphold our decision. I mean, it wrote back in the same, you know, same auto responder, it never spoke to a human. Yeah. But that was kind of a light bulb moment that I wasn't really in a business relationship with these folks. I was, I was mm-hmm. basically held hostage. And uh, so I got mad at him and I decided that, well, if nothing stops me from just reaching my readers directly and selling them, selling to them directly. And so I got to work and it turns out that's not only possible, but it, it turned out to be a far better way, at least in my experience, to find readers and to make money in the, in the publishing business. So wow. what I also discovered, though, is that there are some readers who will always only ever be on Amazon. So I didn't end up firing them completely, but they comprise, they and the other retailers comprise uh, around 17% total of my book sales. The rest is directly to readers. Wow. That is a surprisingly small number of Amazon buyers and a large number of readers that buy from your store personally. That's Uh, Yeah. That, well, I think that's your your marketing background there. I don't think the average author could do that. I'm just saying. I, I have to say, I, I have taken a self-publishing, indie publishing mm-hmm. class um, from Mark Darcy yeah. Dawson, which I'm sure yep. you're familiar with. And I, so I've been on those Facebook pages, and I've heard this kind of story on occasion. From well, other do you have to mail them out who, yourself and everything when they buy them from your website? Or? Um, so I focus primarily on ebooks and audiobooks. There are some, there's a large percentage of readers who will only read paperbacks or hardcovers. And so what I have done is I've, I've found a global printing network that, that I've hooked up to my own store. And so those orders go directly to the, the region and they're produced in the region and shipped with local shipping in the region. Now, what's happened over the last year is those costs have gone up significantly. So the, mm-hmm. the most cost-effective way to do it now is to purchase copies of your book in bulk and then do your own logistics and, and fulfillment. Mm-hmm. So that's a whole, I mean, that, that's a whole thing. Um, mm. There are authors that I work with who do that extremely well and they sell and move a lot of books. I focus my business on eBooks and audiobooks so that I don't have to do that <laughs> because right. mm-hmm. I have three kids and three businesses and it's fill, stuffing envelopes with books and, and making trips to, to the, yeah. I just don't know where I would schedule that in, you know, in my day. Right. But I do know that <laughs> by not focusing as hard on that lately, you know, that's, that's opportunity that I'm going to have to circle back around and, and uh, take advantage of. Because like I say, there are many, many people who, 
who just want to hold a book in their hands for mm-hmm. lots of good reasons. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's yeah. fascinating. I'd be so curious about that percentage of your audience that buys from you directly mm-hmm. versus that Amazon group. And is that consistent among indie authors who have done what you've done, where they, they have their own store and are doing it themselves? Do you think that's a pretty consistent number? Or, or do you think that's something that you've got kind of special because you're doing something right in marketing? Well, it's interesting. Once I figured out how to do this, I figured that lots of other people would want to do it as well. And so I put a program together and what I discovered is that you generally do need a little marketing nerd help just to get all the fussy things to work. There's a bunch of authors who are doing this now. And what we see very consistently is two things. First, what we've found from our data is that most consistently effective way to improve your Amazon sales is to advertise for your direct sales, making no mention of Amazon. So you're you're advertising directly for your store, wow. readers are purchasing from you. And this is what's called in marketing nerd terms of cross-channel effect. So the mechanism is that they'll see your ad on Facebook or Instagram or wherever you're at. And some people will like take a picture, my wife does this, she'll take a picture of the ad. Screenshot. So she doesn't click on it. <laughs> yeah. and, and then she'll go over to Amazon and type the name in and then buy the book there. And that's what's happening here. But the funny thing is, when you just advertise on those platforms and send people directly to Amazon, it doesn't work as well, at least in our mm-hmm. experience. And it also doesn't work as well, uh, unless you're already selling a lot on Amazon, to try to use the Amazon ads network. The main reason is a mathematical one. They're, they're participating in the market that they're making. So they're taking your money to, to display your ad, but they're also taking 30% of the sale. So that changes their calculation. So if it's you mm-hmm. as, an, as a, a relatively small fish compared to, say, like James Patterson or you know, Mm -hmm. somebody like that. And if we both bid the same amount for that advertising space, guess who's going to win? It's, it's not (laughs) me, right? It's James Mm -hmm. Patterson because, you know, he's sold, I don't know. I don't know how many millions more books than I have. So that's kind of why it's (laughs) hard to use the Amazon advertising platform (laughs) to make, to make more sales. Of course, there are people who are doing it. And, um, you know, there are many people who swear by it, but in our, you know, in our milieu, most of the people who sell directly to fans, one of the reasons they're doing it is because they couldn't get that Amazon machine to work for them. So it is interesting how all this plays together. Like it seems counterintuitive that advertising to your store produces sales in your store. And also there's this side benefit of more Amazon sales, but that's, we see that time and time and time again. Maybe it's like if they have Amazon prime, then they don't have to worry about shipping. Yeah, for sure. But it's still mostly ebooks. When you look at the, oh, at the really? distribution okay. of, yeah, it's probably, it's, I'd say seven to one, eight to one ebooks over physical copies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really? Christy likes an e- e-reader and I like a, I like a physical mm-hmm. book. I'm sort of equal opportunity, but I am, I'm an insomniac a lot. So at mm-hmm. night, it's much easier to open my, yeah. you know, paperweight or whatever and yeah. just be like, okay, yeah. Yeah. then, you know, it's not this disturbing so what's interesting is last night, I literally, I just got the new Kindle oh. for Christmas, like the new waterproof cool. one. Yeah. I haven't had a Kindle for a long time because I, I just like paper books, but on occasion when I'm awake at night and I'm traveling, I want to, I want to have my, my Kindle. So I got, I got the new one and I started the latest James Patterson just <laughs> two days ago. It's fantastic. Just read, read, read. Right. And, but last night in the middle of the night, I was awake. And I thought, oh, I want to read. But I turned on my book light and it was so mm-hmm. bright and jarring. Yeah. And I thought, crap, I opened up my Kindle. I was able to buy and download the Ebert version of his book in less mm-hmm. than a minute. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, wow, how impressive that you can just. And my husband was like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm going to put this on. My... This is at two o'clock in the morning because he wanted to get up and see the green comet or something. <laughs> oh, cool. There was some, some. Yeah, some really cool space thing last night. <laughs> I think it's supposed to be tonight too. It hasn't been seen since the Middle Ages. What? Anyway, wow. whatever. Yeah. I'm gonna have to check it out. It took me less than a minute. I could not believe how fast and efficient that yeah. was to get a new book, ebook downloaded to your reader. You know, people have been doing that for a little while now, Kathy. I know, but I'm new. <laughs> it's super convenient that way. But you, you guys will laugh it is. why I like it. Well, I like it because it doesn't matter how many pages are in the book, it still fits in my pocket. 
The second reason I like it right? is because I run across words that I don't know. And if you just hold your oh, finger yeah. on those words you don't know, your phone or your reader will tell you what that word means. I'm like, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. So I that's why I like that. The, I like cool. the your reader. <laughs> And I was wondering, Kathy, because I know Kathy likes to take notes when she reads. I do. You can um, you can highlight them like in a Kindle app. You can. You can drag. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you if you could with your Kindle. And there's like a there aren't even apps that like help you organize your notes mm -hmm. that you save in your e-readers. Like it's it's a whole thing. But I, I, I this was the new is version, and the reason <laughs> this sounds so lazy, I can't believe this. But if I can't sleep, which is just on occasion, not nearly like Christie's, but I like to lay on my side and not move much, right? And so the new one, I think it's called the Oasis mm. or something, it has a button so you don't have to swipe. Mm. So you can even be lazier mm. and you can do this and it turns the pages. Oh yeah, yeah, you just have to hit a button. And that's funny because now when I read, you know, after I've been doing that a lot, then I get a regular mm -hmm. book and I go like this to turn the page. I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> oh really? no, I gotta turn the page. I've, I've found myself reaching for a word I don't know in a, in a paperback to press. No, it. have like, you really? Like, oh, what am I doing? This is crazy. This is, this is a book. So funny. This is an actual yeah. book. It's funny. <laughs> You know, we didn't talk much about your eclectic past, but I thought it would be interesting to see, hear you say what the one thing you think surprises readers the most about your history. You know, you've got like this crypto background and you've got your pilot, I guess, Air mm -hmm. Force. So, yeah, I um, I flew F-16s for a long time. That would be something that, was, that I think everybody would be asking you about, right? People people write about that. They write in and talk to and, and mention that a lot. And it was amazing. I I loved it. It was a huge amount of work, and it's a young man's game. It, it beats your body up over time. But interesting. I didn't realize that. Well, I mean, you 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 pull nine Gs, so you're you're sitting in the seat, and your your body instead of weighing two hundred pounds weighs eighteen hundred pounds, and that's compressing your spine. And, and you're actually many times you're you're looking over your shoulder while you're so your head's in a weird position. So we have we tend to have neck and and spine issues. It's not a game that you can you can play forever, um, but I loved it. Some guys emerge unscathed, but they're pretty rare. Tom Cruise, you know. <laughs> I don't think that's his day job. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I, you know, I love that. I love that world. I the people were just amazing. You know, the friends, many of them, like they're not friends or brothers now. You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. so the camaraderie was amazing and. Uh, the Jets, are, it's an incredible machine, and it's meaningful to serve your country in that way. It, it was for me at the time, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. We didn't know everything we might have needed to know to make more informed decisions about what was actually happening. All that became a little more clear in retrospect. Mm -hmm. um, but our intentions were pure and honorable at the time, for sure. So it, it's a part of my life that I really uh, loved, and there's still days. We live near the Air Force Base in our in our city. And the fellows will come in their F-16s over the house every once in a while. And I'll, sometimes I'll find myself a little misty-eyed, you know. Oh, I, just... <laughs> well, I bet. All right, Christy, why don't you let him have the final question? So we ask this of all our authors. Which of your characters would you like to share a meal with and what would it be? Man, that, I, have a, I like a lot of them. Obviously, I'd love to share a meal with, with Sam. But she's sort of my franchise character. I'd love to share a meal with Quinn. And also, just for entertainment value alone, Fredericks. Yeah, so you could have oh. all three of them there. You could have the all same three meal. Of them at the same, yeah. Fredericks would be. Yeah, he interesting. would be. He'd be interesting. Yeah, he's a. When our when our listeners want to know more about you, where is the best place for them to go? Lars dot buzz l a r s dot b u z z. That's my whatever deal I'm running. That's the place to find it. And um, if there are other authors interested in learning more about whether direct sales is something they're interested in, that's at moauthor.com. A-M-M-O, -M, M like Mike, stands for Author Marketing Mastery Through Optimization, moauthor.com. So those are the two places if you're... Perfect. Well, it's been a lot of fun. I'm, we're glad that you could join us. And uh, the only thing we have left to do is a toast to future sales, lots of future sales. Yes. Here, here. Cheers. I'll drink to that. Cheers to that. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks for joining us for today's episode. Subscribe to our podcast on our website, gameofbookspodcast.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you liked what you heard, you can give us a five-star rating or review. You can also subscribe on YouTube where you can watch and listen. On gameofbookspodcast.com, you can find all the information about what we talked about on this episode. And you can sign up for our newsletter and enter our fun contests and giveaways. We also post our stories and links on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Hope to see you there. I can guarantee you that we had fun today. And we hope you did too. Cheers.